Uh, so we're ready to move on um, to the next person in the trio, Nigel Savory from Bristol, um, who studies transcription coupled repair and the effect of DNA damage on transcription. And um, of course, I have some connection with Nigel through my long-term research associate, um, who's now um, elsewhere, Virgil Rhodius, um, who trained with Steve Busby, uh, just like Nigel did. Okay, Nigel is going to talk to us about MFD, UVRD, and TCR, and open and shut case. Nigel. Lovely, thank you. Can you hear me and see the slides? Yes. Yeah, that's great, thank you. So um, thank you ever so much for the invitation. Happy birthday, Dr. Whitkin. Um, I'm gonna tell you a couple of short stories, uh, one about MFD, another about UVRD, um, and sort of partly linked by this rather awful punny title that I came up with when Richard reminded me I had to have a, a title. So the first, let me make this work. The first story is about MFD and the opening concern is the confirmational changes that, uh, that Seth talked about. This is um, a little bit of history itself. It, it's uh, the product of the PhD of Gwen Brower, who like James that Terence was just talking about was um, part of an European Union Marie Curie training fellowship. So this is a little bit of history because it not only relates to a time when as a British scientist, I could access funds from the European Union. It also relates to a time where it was thought a good idea to send students around uh, Europe picking up new techniques and, and training globally, of course, in the last 12 months, that has seemed like a crazy idea. But Gwen was co-supervised by Mark Dillingham in Bristol. And as part of her training, the work that I'm going to present here was done with Terence and James in Paris, and also with Peter and Vlad uh, in, in Germany. So the question that we were interested in was the opening of this domain two, domain three interface that uh, Seth highlighted in his talk. Let me just put the clock on so I know where I'm going. Uh, as Seth said, this clamp, this, here we have the, the N-terminus of the protein and the C-terminus of the protein, and they come together and clamp the motor proteins closed in, a, in an inactive state. And what this also does is masks the interaction surface of the protein with UVRA. So the motor is turned off, uh, and the residues that are involved in interacting with the first protein in the nucleotide excision repair pathway, UVRA, are the same residues or an overlapping set of residues that are involved in the interaction with this uh, C-terminal domain. So this intramolecular interaction is blocking many things happening. So we know that this has to open up at some stage because we know that this protein will interact with UVRA. And what we were interested in originally was, was when this uh, opening takes place in the process of transcription coupled repair. And as we were doing the work and Seth's beautiful structures were coming out, we realized that perhaps what we were asking was not when does it happen, but when must it happen? Because I'm gonna show you that um, for some of the steps, or for many of the steps, in fact, for in transcription coupled repair, the complete opening that's seen in, in Seth's structures is not absolutely essential, although presumably from the structures, you know, that is the order in which they occur. I also wanted to show this slide um, because I was trying to think of a, a link to Dr. Whitkin's work, and you did actually, apart from inspiring all the work, you did save my bacon at an important point in my career. So this particular paper came out uh, in molecular cell at a, a time that I really needed uh, a, a paper in molecular cell. And it was a biochemistry paper, and we did lots of work showing how mutations in MFD that affected the interaction with uh, between domain two and domain seven and with UVRA affected transcription coupled repair in the test tube. And we also did some in vivo TCR assays, which the referees thought, and I have to agree, were a bit less convincing than the in vitro experiments. So a referee, probably somebody in this room, actually, given the, the audience that we have, told me that I, you know, we needed to do something a bit more convincing. And one of the strange things, frustrating things about working on MFD is that the phenotype that it causes, certainly in terms of UV sensitivity, is, is not very strong. So you can knock the gene out and you don't see a great fall off in, in UV sensitivity. 
even though you're not doing transcription coverage repair. So I actually did do mutation frequency decline assays, uh, and we saw a beautiful effect where, where with the wild type protein, you can see the mutation frequency decline exactly as Carol was talking about. And if we removed this, this blue part or we made substitutions in it that stopped it interacting with UVRA, we were able to abolish the mutation frequency uh, decline effect, which was something of a relief because the, the review of Dr. Witkins that Seth talked about in, uh, in the early 90s pointed out that mutation frequency decline is, is not necessarily a straightforward map onto transcription coupled repair. There are some extra complexities there, but, but fortunately for these purposes, it worked. Anyway, we we're interested in when these two domains separate. And we know that they do because as Seth has shown you, this is just one of their structures. This is the second loading structure. I've kept the orientation of, of the UVRB homology module the same. And you can see there's about an 80 angstrom uh, uh, separation of these two residues shown in space build are immediately adjacent to one another in the APO structure that was sold by Alex back in 2006. So to constrain this, we, okay, what, well, so at what point might it happen? Well, during the process of binding to RNA polymerase, dissociating it and recruiting the repair proteins, there are many different activities that MFD has to exhibit. And you're familiar with them now, it must bind DNA, it must bind RNA polymerase, it does ITP hydrolysis and it has to couple that to DNA translocation. It's then gonna displace the RNA polymerase from the stool site. It's gonna to lead to this translocating intermediate, this very highly processive thing that happens after the transcription bubble has collapsed and the RNA has gone. Uh, and then at some point it's gonna to need to repair the, uh, recruit the repair factors. And at this point, MFD, as Terence showed, uh, leaves, it goes with RNA polymerase and the repair process continues in the same way that it would have done if it had been initiated by the global NER part, NER pathway. So cleavage by the UVRC proteins, strand displacement by UVRD, and filling in by uh, a DNA polymerase. So we wanted to see at which of these steps it was important that the, um, the NNC terminal domains were able to separate. And we did this with um, cross-linking. So if we were starting this again, we would probably use uh, unnatural amino acid incorporation, but the way that it was done was that Gwen knocked out all of the natural cysteines within the protein, reintroduced two cysteines, one in domain two and one in domain seven, and then used a uh, malamide cross-linker to join these two things together. Now, this was not an original approach. So, uh, the labs of Alex Dikonesco and Irina Artsimovich several years ago had made similar cysteine substitutions and cross-linked them directly just by forming the disulfide in an otherwise wild type protein. So some of what I'm going to show you is confirmation of their earlier work, but there is some new stuff at, at the end. The reason we did it this way was that we had a plan to try lots of different lengths of, of cross-linkers, but uh, all the data I'm going to show you is done with the shortest one, which has an eight angstrom linker between domain two and domain seven. So the cross-linking works. So we have a cysteine-free version of the protein. We then introduce the double mutants where we have the cysteine at each end and we have the cross-link version. And you can see the cross-linking by a shift on a protein gel. And we were getting over 90% uh, cross-linking in these reactions. So if you've got this protein and it's cross-linked, what can it and can't it do? Well, cross-linking those two domains doesn't abolish ATPase activity, although it does reduce it as shown previously. This is just the isolated protein, no RNA polymerase, plus or minus DNA. You can see that uh, you can still get DNA-dependent ATPase with those two domains cross-linked to one another. It doesn't abolish DNA binding activity either. So uh, MFD gives horribly ugly band shift experiments, but this is on a 280 base pair linear piece of DNA. The wild type protein gives a shift in the presence of the non-hydrolyzable or poorly hydrolyzable um, ATP gamma S. If you try and do the same experiment with no nucleotides or with ATP, you don't see a shift. And the intermediates show the same kind of binding and the cross-linked MFD can also bind to DNA possibly a little, weak, well, a little more weakly. So it does a bunch of things, not quite as well as the wild type protein, but it does some things better. So for example, it stimulates 
the RNA polymerase independent DNA translocation. One of the ways that we can look at the translocation activity of MFD is uh, using a triplex forming oligonucleotide bound into the DNA downstream of a stalled RNA polymerase. And this is labeled, so if MFD displaces the RNA polymerase and continues to translocate, it will displace this oligonucleotide. And what you can see here is in, in this situation where you have to go a few tens of bases, all of these proteins, including the cross-link protein, were able to do this translocation. But actually, this isn't quite a, a true picture because we do the control experiments where we don't have a stored transcription elongation complex to load the proteins. And the wild type protein is unable to translocate on DNA without being loaded on the transcription elongation complex, at least at a level that can be detected in this assay. But the double mutant that has the cysteines in the interface or the cross-linked MFD both translocate on their own. Now, this is quite typical of things in which that interface has been slightly opened. It's surprising to see it with a cross-linked protein, but substitutions that uh, prevent domain seven binding to domain two, for example, seem to allow the RNA, the, the MFD to open up slightly and translocate on its own. So we can't tell whether this translocation in the presence of RNA polymerase had been loaded here or whether it had simply found the, uh, the TFO on its own and translocated a very short distance to displace it. So it still translocates anyway. So does the cross-linking abolish RNA polymerase displacement? Now, from the structures and showing that extensive wrapping um, in, in the cryo-EM structures, you might think it would. Um, if you're familiar with Alex's work, you know that it probably isn't going to. Uh, and in fact, that's what we saw. So this is a, a band shift, a quantification of band shift experiments where RNA polymerase has been stalled uh, and can be displaced by MFD. And um, what we see is that the wild type protein and the cysteine free version do this quite effectively but the cross-link protein does it less effectively, but it can still do it. So again, not quite as good as the wild type. Uh, there's no snow plowing going on here. It's not simply moving along the DNA and barreling stuff off it. It is a proper specific loading at the RNA polymerase, because if we use a version of the RNA polymerase that won't bind to the RNA polymerase interaction domain of MFD, we see that none of the proteins are able to displace the elongation complex. So what we have is a protein that pretty much does the same kinds of things as the wild type, but generally less well with a slightly odd translocation activity. The surprising result or the informative result comes from uh, the magnetic tweezer type experiments that Gwen went and did with James and Terence in Paris. So James, uh, Terence has already explained how these work. We had a promoter facing towards the magnetic, um, towards the surface of, of the slide. And what you see is the same kinds of traces that, um, that Terence has shown you. So this is a situation where we had one of the controls, an uncross-linked MFD present. Uh, RNA polymerase is able to initiate transcription, form an elongation complex at this level. And then when it's found by the, uh, by the MFD, the MFD dissociates or, or closes the transcription bubble, releases the RNA and comes up to this intermediate, this translocating intermediate stage. And then eventually that is resolved and you come back up to the initial situation. Now, if you do that with the cross-link protein, this is where you see the difference. So here we have an initiation event, we have an elongation complex, and when it's found by the cross-linked MFD, there is no intermediate on this particular event. It goes straight up to release DNA. So the MFD RNA polymerase complex has completely fallen off the DNA. Occasionally, you do see an intermediate, but it's very short lived. And this can be quantified. And here we see a, a distribution of lifetimes for the wild type protein, the cysteine free and double mutant intermediates that are not cross linked. And you see that all of them have a, a lifetime of about 200 to 300 seconds. Now, as Terence explained, what's happening here is these complexes are translocating along the DNA. They're highly processive, very stable. And to translocate the, the distance from the, from the stall site to the bead, uh, five nucleotides per second is going to take you this two to 300 seconds. For the cross-linked MFD, most of the reactions had no measurable intermediate at all. And those that did have a measurable intermediate had a, half, uh, had a lifetime of only 12 seconds. So 
when must MFD, when does MFD open is probably in the initial loading steps, as, as Seth has shown, when must it open? Well, it's fine not to have opened when it binds, it's fine not to have opened when it displaces RNA polymerase, but it must open in order to form that processive um, translocation intermediate. So, not surprisingly, we, we've done in vitro transcription coupled repair assays and it's unable to do the later steps because it can't form this intermediate and also because the binding to UVRA is going to be blocked by the crosslink. Is it possible, in given the structures that, that Seth's group have produced, is, this, is it possible to retain this crosslink? Um, it is topologically and, and Seth assures me that, that looking at it, this, this can still happen. So this is a a cartoon of the loaded complex looking down the barrel of the DNA, where you can see, if you watch the topology of it, I've rather exaggerated the linkers, the MFD protein is wrapped all the way around the DNA and then domain seven is back at the bottom. If domain one, uh, well, sorry, the UVRB homology module was to remain associated with domain seven, presumably as this translocation takes place with domain four staying bound on the RNA polymerase, it would drag this, um, this end terminal domain with it. And then you're still able to push against the RNA polymerase, but you don't have the topological change that's necessary for the high processivity that's seen in that translocating intermediate. So essentially, Seth, we need the eighth structure. Seven cryo -AMs is very impressive. Please can we see what the translocating intermediate looks like? The second topic that I, I want to talk to you about deals with UVRD or PCRA. So I'm going to be talking about PCRA, which is the UVRD homologue in Bacillus subtilis, which is the organism this work was done in. This work was done by Inigo, who was also on the DNA Repairman Training Network, uh, supervised by Mark and myself. Um, various other people have given some preliminary work for the, for the um, project, but Frank Sobert and James Alt, his technician in Leeds, were critical for the particular experiments that I'm going to be showing you. So, PCRA or UVRD is a multifunctional superfamily one helicase. It is involved in a lot of different processes in the cell, including nucleotide excision repair, and mismatch repair, and it's targeted to those processes by interactions with specific partner proteins. And we and others have shown that one of its partner proteins is RNA polymerase, suggesting a role of UVRD linked to transcription. And my other open and shut case here is, is what is that role? Is it open and shut what UVRD does? Uh, and the answer is no, there's, there's controversy. Uh, and I think one of the things that we've learned from studying MFD uh, is that you know, proteins do many different things. So maybe there is no one correct answer. So the link to transcription coupled repair here is that the lab of Evgeny Nudler uh, quite a while ago showed that UVRD in E. coli is able to pull RNA polymerase backwards uh, backtracking the RNA polymerase, and they proposed a model in which this would be an alternative transcription coupled nucleotide excision repair pathway, recruiting the repair proteins via interactions between UVRD and UVRB, and possibly NUSA and UVRA. Um, there's been some genome-wide analysis of the repair of UV-induced products that, that suggests that the strand specificity that's characteristic of transcription coupled repair is dependent upon MFD and not UVRD, but I know that that result, you know, there's, there's debate about the extent and the timings in which such a pathway might take place. There are other proposed pathways or roles for uh, PCRA or UVRD to do with transcription. This is a, a picture from one of Hura's reviews showing that these proteins have roles in helping to resolve or avoid replication uh, conflicts with transcription. So we were interested in understanding how PCRA and UVRD interact with RNA polymerase and see whether that would give any clues as to what it was doing. Um, the approach that Inigo took to understand this was um, hydrogen deuterium exchange mass spectrometry. Uh, the way that this works is that if you have a protein uh, that you've prepared in, in uh, hydrated or hydrogen water, and then you uh, incubate it in deuterated water, you get exchange or slow exchange of the, the protons. And you can see this with this change in color. And if you, they form a complex, then the areas where the proteins are interacting 
will be protected and you'll see slower exchange in those areas. So by, by monitoring this, you can see where the proteins interact. So the C-terminal domain of the protein, which I should have highlighted on an earlier slide, uh, is essential for the interaction of PCRA with RNA polymerase. It will interact in isolation and it's a Tudor domain, which is the same kind of fold that's used by MFD to bind to RNA polymerase. So to check that this process worked, Inigo did, uh, looked at uh, um, the CTD binding to RNA polymerase and saw which regions of this, of this C-terminal Tudor domain were protected. This is the kind of trace you see where the, the red uh, shows you what happens with the protein on its own, and the blue shows you the protection on the peptides uh, across the residue numbers um, in the complex. Uh, the, the thickness of the, the blue stuff here shows you effectively the errors. So what we're looking for is something that goes low, and you can see that large parts of this very small domain are protected when it binds to RNA polymerase. So that's not surprising. When we map that onto the Tudor domain, we see that most of it's protected. Uh, when we look at the side chains, we can see at one particular surface, and, and these were residues that had already been identified um, in the lab as being important for this interaction. So the experiment works. More interestingly is looking to see where this binds on RNA polymerase. So um, it's a very small domain, so you're expecting to see only a small part. Inigo had to work his way through all the subunits of RNA polymerase, but what he found was a small residue on the beta subunit. Now, very surprisingly, this was in a lineage-specific insertion domain, so part of the RNA polymerase that's not highly conserved. Um, we have the, the structure here that Peter Lewis shared this from his Bacillus subtilis transcription elongation complex structure. Unfortunately, the, the key part of the residue, when you align these and look for conservation, this is the web logo that you come up with. The key part of it on this beta term is, is missing, um, but you can find similar things in other RNA polymerases. It seems unusual to have an important interaction domain in a lineage specific insertion. Um, but the same motif appears in different places within the lineage specific insertion um, in, in different RNA polymerases. So we can check that this works. We make uh, substitutions of the key residues. We can uh, abolish, we can weaken the interaction between PCRA and the beta subunit in, um, in pull downs. And Taking this motif and doing a search for it in ProSite for other proteins in Bacillus subtilis proteum that might have the same motif, we come up with seven proteins, four of which have already been shown to interact with, um, with PCRA. So the RNA polymerase beta subunit, as I've already shown you, uh, UVRB has the same motif, and YWHK and YXAL, these are uh, homology modules, have exactly the same motif forming the same kind of fold. So UVRD interacts with both RNA polymerase and UVRB apparently using the same interaction motif. Uh, we can see it here in UVRB. We can see that substitutions within UVRB in this motif abolish the interaction or reduce the interaction with PCRA. And interestingly, um, for those interested in nucleotide excision repair, this UVRD interaction motif is immediately adjacent to the surface that interacts with the UVRA. And in fact, that some of the residues may be uh, involved in this interaction as well, although substitutions that abolish the interaction don't fall here. So uh, interesting future work will be to see whether UVRD and UVRA combine simultaneously. How am I doing for time? So that's where the C-terminal domain binds, but it's a much bigger protein than this. Where else does it bind? Well, he did the same experiments with um, the full length protein and identified that it bound around the RNA or DNA exit channels. And this is something that correlates with what Evgeny Nudler's lab showed when they first looked at this interaction using cross-linking, where they found that UVRD could interact with the beta flat tip. So the C-terminal domain is interacting on one part of the protein down here, and the bulk of the protein is interacting up on the other surface around the RNA exit channel. That seems like a long way apart, but uh, 
if you dock these, they certainly look a long way apart, but there is a very long linker between the core of the protein and the Tudor domain. So this is just to show you that it's not beyond the realms of possibility that a linker would reach from here to here. So it's interacting around the RNA exit channel. Why might it be doing that? Well, Inigo wondered whether it could be unwinding our loops. So we had our loop productions in Terence's uh, talk. We're now looking about potentially unwinding our loops. So the idea would be if you had an R loop behind the RNA polymerase, UVRD might bind and translocate forward along the template strand in a three prime to five prime direction, removing that R loop. So the first question to see whether this is plausible is to see whether PCRA can unwind DNA-RNA hybrids. And the answer is that yes, it can. These are just oligo strand displacement assays. And as long as you've got DNA as the single stranded overhang, PCRA will load and it will displace either DNA or RNA, but it won't move along single-stranded RNA in order to displace either of the nucleic acids. This is correlated by the fact that if you look at the stimulation of the ATPase activity, poly-DT will stimulate, but poly-U won't. So it doesn't appear to be able to use single-stranded RNA as a substrate, but it can unwind an RNA-DNA hybrid. So it can do this biochemically in a very purified system, do our loops accumulate in cells that don't have PCRA activity? And Inigo looked at this in two different ways. He looked at a transdominantly expressing a, a complete full length protein that was uh, helicase dead, or he looked at trying to the transdominant effect of putting in the free C terminal Tudor domain. Uh, in order to do this, he made strains that could overexpress these various proteins and then looked at our loop formation using the S9.6 um, antibody. Uh, and what he saw uh, shown on the blots here and on the graphs at the bottom is that overexpressing a transdominant dead PCRA or overexpressing the native C terminal domain, but not a mutation, a mutated version of the C terminal domain that won't bind to RNA polymerase led to an increase in our loops. So this is consistent with the interaction of PCRA with RNA polymerase, reducing, reducing R loop formation within the cells. Uh, the same thing has, is seen if you make a deletion of E. coli that lacks UVRD, you see this same effect. So the take home message from this second part is that RNA polymerase contains a helicase interaction motif in this uh, lineage specific insertion domain. Uh, the same motif is found in UVRB, but interestingly not in MFD, although it's in the region of MFD that's homologous to UVRB, and it's not found in MUTL either, uh, and that PCRA helicase suppresses R loops. We've shown it here as moving three prime to five prime on the template strand. An alternative method for suppressing the R loops would be to move your motor onto the other strand and backtrack the RNA polymerase as shown in previous people's works, in which case the RNA polymerase would be acting as the plowshare that removes that R loop. So with that, I will end. I've already said my acknowledgements. So thanks very much for your attention and thanks again for the invitation to talk. <laughs>